everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and right now it is full set limited review week on my channel for Guilds of Ravnica. Over the last several days, I've looked at every single white, blue, and black card in this set and given my thoughts on them, and today we're continuing with red. If you're new to my set reviews and you want to know what the grades I give to cards mean, you can find a link in the description below to a video that explains it. Now, let's look at our first red card, which is Arc Light Phoenix, which for three generic and a red is a 3 2 Phoenix at Mythic Rare. It's a 3 2 with flying and haste, and it says. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've cast three or more instant and sorcery spells this turn, return Arclight Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield. A 4 mana 3-2 of Flying in Haste is pretty nice. We recently saw it in the form of Snare Thopter, which was a nice little card. However, it wasn't a bomb, and the Thopter had a useful card type and was easier to cast. Yeah, I know this Phoenix can come back if you cast a bunch of spells, and Snare Thopter couldn't do that, but asking you to cast three spells in a single turn in Limited is kind of a tall order. It does get a little easier in a world of cheap jumpstart spells, but you really need to have lots of low converted mana cost instants and sorceries in your deck to fully take advantage of this thing, and the payoff, while nice, isn't incredible. A 3-2 flyer with haste is nice, like I said, but not game-changing, though when it's free, in addition to the spells you cast, it is obviously a pretty good deal. I think that overall, this Phoenix barely sneaks into the lower B range since it has such a good fail case, and that means you feel alright about first picking it, but I wouldn't be shocked to see it go a little lower once we start playing this format, so yeah, I'm giving it a B-. Next, we have Barging Sergeant, which for four generic and a red is a 4-2 Minotaur Soldier at Common. It has Haste and it has Mentor, and this is the first time we're seeing this mechanic in this video, so I'll read the reminder text this time, which says, Whenever this creature attacks, put a plus and plus one counter on target attacking creature with lesser power. A 5 mana 4-2 with Haste is not very good, but coming with the Mentor mechanic here is nice. It immediately comes into play and represents not just 4 damage, but potentially 5 damage because of the plus one plus one counter it'll put on the creature it mentors. The fact that it can come into play in Mentor right away is not something the other cards with Mentor can do, uh, at least at common and uncommon. Assuming you have a creature who can attack with him that is less than 4 power, it shouldn't be too hard to set up a big turn, especially if your opponent's shields are down. There will certainly be board states, though, where this guy can't just barge through, but most of the time they're going to be forced to block him so he doesn't keep mentoring other creatures. I think he's a decent top curve card for aggressive red decks in the format, but nothing special, really. I'm going to give him a C. Next, we have Book Devourer, which for 5 generic and a red is a 4-5 beast at Uncommon. It has Trample, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may discard all the cards in your hand if you do draw that many cards. A 6-mana 4-5 with Trample is not very good. I do like the rest of the card, that if you want to. Should it ever do damage to your opponent, you can pitch your hand and draw all new cards. This will be especially nice in the later part of the game where you probably have a couple of lands sitting in your hand doing nothing. Though, the chances of that happening are a little low in a format that already has Jumpstart, which is obviously in the same color as the Devourer. Anyway, I think that in the end, this card is fine, but not much else. I don't think you take it early, and I think you cut it pretty regularly, and I think it, that means it's a C-. Next, we have Command the Storm, which for 4 generic and a red is an instant at common, and it deals 5 damage to target creature. 5 mana to do 5 at instant speed is reasonably efficient, though not exactly something you're really excited about. This is the kind of card that could slip a lot if this format is faster than a normal format, but I think it will probably be pretty good. It can kill the vast majority of creatures in the format, and doing it at instant speed opens up the possibility of blowouts. I don't think this quite moves into the realm of premium removal. It is merely solid removal, and I'm going to give it a C+. Next, we have Cosmotronic Wave, which for 3 generic and a red is a common sorcery, and Cosmotronic Wave deals 1 damage to each creature your opponents control, and your opponents creatures can't block this turn. This card's kind of weird. Normally these things that make it so creatures can't block until end of turn are cast only when they win you the game on the spot, so adding that it does one damage to your opponent's creatures honestly won't matter much if that's what you're casting this for. In the end, this is sort of like a split card, where one side kills all of your opponent's X1s, and the other side makes your opponent's creatures unable to block. And by the way, note it actually makes flyers unable to block, unlike some cards we've seen recently. Mostly, I think you just don't play this card. If your deck is crazy aggressive and it needs a way to punch through stabilized boards, you can run it, and it can do that for you, but I think it's mostly a sideboard card against decks with lots of X1s, and I'm going to give it a D+. Next, we have Direct Current, which for one generic and two red mana is a common sorcery, and it deals two damage to any target, and it has Jumpstart, which is the is it mechanic that we're seeing for the first time in this video, and it says you may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs, then exile the card. This is an interesting one. Sorcery speed, three mana to do two damage to something is a playable card on its own, but not very efficient. It's like a C-, maybe a C. 
uh, its sorcery speed, and that holds it back too. Adding jumpstart to it makes it a little more interesting. Being able to pick off two small creatures with this or do the last 40 your opponent seems nice. Plus, spells matter decks in blue-red look super real in this format, so it helps you trigger those twice. Still, it isn't an incredible card or anything. Just a nice one that I think you play in all of your red decks, but I don't think it's one you take with an early pick. I think it's a C+. Next, we have Electrostatic Field, which is one generic mana and one red mana for a 0-4 wall at Uncommon. It has Defender, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, it deals one damage to each opponent. This reminds me of cards like Thermal Alchemist and Nettle Drone, and that's a good place to be. Decent defensive stats combined with the ability to slowly bleed your opponent to death is pretty nice, although, to be fair, the Nettle Drone didn't actually have defensive stats. But anyway, it's worth noting that this is not going to be very good in a Boros deck, but be great in Izzet decks. I mean, you could play it in your Boros deck, but it isn't going to be very good there. You want to be curving out with a Boros deck, you want to be mentoring things, you want to have aggressive creatures. Your average Boros deck will have spells, but not really enough to want to play this. I'm going to give this two grades. It basically amounts to build around grades. In this case, it is sort of guild specific. In a Boros deck, this wouldn't be especially good, but isn't like unplayable. It's probably like a C minus. In an Izzet deck where you have access to more jumpstart and are more interested in playing a bunch of spells because of all the other cards that make you want to play spells, I think it's a legit win condition and a B minus. This has a mediocre floor and a high ceiling. And I think it's somewhat reasonable to take with a first pick in a weaker pack where there isn't anything really impressive in the pack and you can settle for taking a card that's sort of a build around. Next we have Erratic Cyclops, which for three generic and a red is a 0-8 Cyclops Shaman at rare. It has Trample, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, it gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is that spell's converted mana cost. Obviously, this is a build around. Your deck needs to have lots of instant and sorcery spells, or he is pretty much garbage. I mean, a four mana 0-8 blocks, okay, I guess, and is it decks will probably be interested in blocking. The problem is, lots of instants and sorceries isn't even enough. You need those that either have jumpstart or decently high converted mana costs, and I don't think the payoff here is worth the headache most of the time. Even in a deck with a decent number of instants and sorceries, this Cyclops is going to be too erratic. It's going to be a 0-8 way too frequently, and sometimes even when you get it up to a 3-8, it's not like it can attack or anything. I think it's a D in your typical red deck and a C in a deck where you have lots of other spell payoffs playoffs pushing you in that direction. Next we have Experimental Frenzy, which for three generic and a red is an enchantment at rare. It says you may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may play the top card of your library. You can't play cards from your hand, and you can pay three generic and a red to destroy it. This kind of reminds me of Midnight Oil from a couple sets ago, a super reckless way to gain card advantage, and one that will become problematic if you don't win quickly, but still a source of card advantage. Keep in mind, you can play lands from your library, so if you have a land on top and you haven't played one, you can play it, then maybe you hit a spell, and if it just keeps going, then that could be a lot of fun. But that's the ideal scenario. It is also entirely possible to end up with a card on the top of your library you just can't cast, and in that situation, you're going to find yourself having to destroy your own enchantment since you've basically locked yourself out of the game. This means you can only play Experimental Frenzy in the extreme late game when you have a ton of mana lying around. While it reminds me of Midnight Oil, I don't think it will be as good. Things can just go bad too easily, and it's only really good late. This is admittedly a hard card to get right without playing with it or against it, but for now, I think I would suggest avoiding it, and you should, yeah, I think it's just an F. Next, we have Fearless Halberdier, which for two generic and a red is a 3-2 human warrior at common. Red always seems to get a vanilla 3 mana 3-2, and they're always mediocre. You'll play them sometimes if you need help curving out, but ideally, you'll have better 3 drops, you know, and, and that makes this a D. Next, we have Fire Urchin, which for one generic and a red is a 1-3 elemental at common. It has trample, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, it gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. 2 mana 1-3 is kind of alright, and adding both trample and the ability to get bigger at potentially instant speed isn't bad either. It's also a creature that's not bad to mentor, because it has a keyword ability and it has low power to begin with, so mentoring it a couple times isn't crazy. But this isn't the spell payoff you're hoping gets past you. You'll play it in your spell deck or in your aggressive deck. Uh, but it isn't going to bring your whole deck together or anything. It's like the classic definition of filler, and I'm going to give it a C. Next, we have Goblin Banneret, which for one red mana is a 1-1 Goblin Soldier at Uncommon. It has Mentor, and it has an activated ability where you can pay one generic and a red to give it plus two, plus zero until end of turn. This card's been kind of polarizing since it was spoiled. I've seen a lot of people say that it's going to be an incredible one-drop in Limited, and I disagree. Uh, this Banneret is an interesting spin on a card that is usually pretty much an F. That is, cards like Bellows Lizard and Lava Step Raider. One-mana creatures that can pump their power, 
but can't pump their toughness at all and die to literally any blocker. These cards are usually so bad because they have bad base stats that quickly get outclassed in a game of limited, and then if you want to just trade it for a 2-drop, in this case, for example, you have to pay a total of 3 mana to kill most 2-drops with this, so you're actually probably behind on mana if you do kill their creature. You have to pump more mana into this just to trade, and the higher up you go, you're just going to be more and more inefficient. At the same time, on the flip side, you could say, this can trade for anything if you have enough mana around, and that's true. But, uh, how often is your opponent going to be blocking with a creature that is big when they can just block it with anything that has one or more power? Uh, it's not hard to do, and you'll basically always have to spend more mana than whatever is blocking it costs to take it down. Now, I do think this guy is better than his brethren who I give Fs to. This is basically because of the Mentor ability, which means that he actually does have some utility late, since he can start pumping his friends, and if you have enough mana lying around, he can theoretically pump anything. Problem there is, by the way, you have to pump the goblin pretty early to get the mentor effect to trigger. You have to do it before you declare attacks, so you're opening yourself up to your opponent destroying the guy after you pump mana into him, and if you do more than two, you're basically time walking himself. Where he does get interesting, though, is when you mentor him a few times, and that is true with several of the mentors. Then he can attack much more safely and pump more creatures without putting all of that mana and effort in. Still, I don't think it's particularly good. I think you'll play it sometimes in your aggressive red decks that all your cards say Mentor on them, and you go one drop with Mentor, two drop with Mentor, three drop with Mentor, and if you're doing that, things are going to get nuts, right? So it's going to be like a powerful card sometimes, but it's not that useful in the late game, and it's not going to be able to Mentor things without really putting your neck out there. And overall, I, I don't think you want to play this most of the time, um, but I think you do occasionally in the very aggressive red decks out there, red-white Boros decks especially, but I think it's a D plus. Next we have Goblin Crater Maker, which for one generic and a red is a 2-2 uncommon, and it has an activated ability where you can pay one and sacrifice it, and then you choose one. You either destroy target colorless non-land permanent or deal two damage to a creature. This is a goblin I can get behind. Between having solid stats as a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, this dude also makes craters, which apparently means that he can shock creatures or blow up artifacts. Those are the only non-land colorless permanents in this set. This means he has some utility all game long while being able to help you curve out early. I think this guy's good enough that you consider first picking him in weaker packs, and I'm giving him a B-. minus. Next, we have another goblin, Goblin Locksmith, which for one generic and a red is a 2-1 goblin rogue at common, and whenever it attacks, creatures with defender can't block this turn. Kind of underwhelming. 2 for a 2-1 is usually like a D. This adds some text that will be relevant once in a while. This set does have an unusual number of defenders in it, and I guess that's good enough to pump it up to a D+, but basically you'll play this if you're desperate for a 2-drop, and yeah, sometimes that text will matter, but I think mostly it won't. Next we have Gravitic Punch, which for 3 generic and a red is a common sorcery, and it says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target player, and it has jumpstart. I'm never big on Lava Axe effects, and that is essentially what this is. Granted, it could find itself being way more efficient than Lava Axe, and you can cast it twice, and Lava Axe is always better in multiples, so this could be a nice way to close out a game with your opponent, but the fact that it is so easy to disrupt, just kill or bounce the creature that is targeted, and so clunky at sorcery speed, I'm not super interested in playing this. I don't think you should either in most cases, and I think it's a D. Next we have Hellkite Whelp, which for 4 generic and a red is a 3-3 dragon at uncommon. It has flying, and when it attacks it deals 1 damage to target creature defending player controls. To start with, a 5 mana 3-3 flyer is alright. Adding the ability to take down X1s is nice. I kind of wish it could also do 1 damage to the player too, in a situation where it doesn't make sense for you to do 1 damage to a creature, but and that would probably push it up to uh, a higher grade, but... Obviously, it can kill X1s, and even if it can't kill something with the ability, the fact that it does one damage to something may suddenly make one of your other attacks into trades, and that means you have more attacks available, potentially. This is a nice curve topper for red decks. I think you always play it. I'm giving it a C+. Next, we have Inescapable Blaze, which for 4 generic and 2 red is an uncommon instant. It can't be countered, and it deals 6 damage to any target. This is another expensive but effective red removal spell. Inescapable Flame costs one more than Govern the Storm and does one more damage, but it can also target players, which is definitely relevant. It also can't be countered, and that will come up sometimes. As we saw in the blue set review, there is a decent amount of counter magic around. If this only targeted creatures, it would be a little worse, since it would barely be an upgrade over Govern the Storm. But targeting players with six damage is a pretty real thing, especially when it's also coupled with the ability to kill almost any creature in the format at instant speed. Six mana is a lot and kind of a pain, I guess, but I think the upside is too real not to be on board with this. I think you feel good about first picking this, and I'm giving it a B-. 
Next, we have Lava Coil, which for one generic and a red is an uncommon sorcery, and it deals 4 damage to target creature. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. This is excellent removal for red. 2 mana to do 4 is great, even at sorcery speed, and the fact that it exiles what it kills matters in a format where there are a lot of graveyard shenanigans. I think you first picked this, including over its friend Inescapable Blaze. Inescapable Blaze maybe do way more damage, but Lava Coil is far more efficient, and I think you take it even over most of the rares or mythics in this set. I'm going to give it a B+. Next, we have Legion Warboss, which for two generic and a red is a 2-2 goblin soldier at rare. It has Mentor, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you create a 1-1 red goblin creature token. That token gains haste until end of turn, and attacks this combat if able. This is a cool card that is a bit of a callback to Goblin Rabble Master. A 3-mana 2-2 that spits out a 1-1 every turn is pretty nice. Even if that token has to send itself into battle every turn, you're basically getting a free attack, and there will be times where your opponent just can't block the token easily, especially if you have combat tricks or mentoring going on. Of course, the War Boss can start mentoring the tokens himself, but his own sort of low stats make attacking with him a little bit risky. Overall, I don't actually think this is a great card, at least in limited. I think in a very aggressive deck it will perform nicely, obviously, but there will be plenty of times where you just can't do anything with the War Boss or his token friends because of their low stats. I don't think he's bad, I just don't think you should first pick him. I'm going to give him a C+. Next we have Maniacal Rage, which for one generic and a red is an aura at common, has enchant creature, and enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and can't block. This is a reprint, I think, or at least a functional reprint. This kind of card is always interesting since you can use it to make one of your creatures bigger, or you can use it to make one of your opponent's creatures unable to block. Obviously, you only do the latter when it's basically going to end the game. Just because it is flexible, though, doesn't mean it's good. Both of those effects are only good in certain scenarios, and I don't think this card will offer enough to make it worth the inherent risk that all auras have, the chance of you getting two for one. It does get a little better in a format that has Mentor in it, because it makes a creature able to Mentor more things, and I think this will find its way into the occasional uh, red aggressive deck, especially Boros decks. But I think most of the time you should just cut it, and I think that means it's a D. Next, we have Maximize Velocity, which for one red mana is a common sorcery, and target creature gets plus one, plus one, and gains haste until end of turn, and it has Jumpstart. We saw the other Maximize Jumpstart card when we looked at blue, and I think this one's worse. Sure, sometimes you can cast it twice in a turn and give two new creatures you played haste, but that involves having a total of four cards in your hand, the two creatures, the spell, and something to discard to it. Why are you holding on to that many cards if you can cast them all? I think people will look at this and imagine that scenario, but it's not particularly realistic. I think Flying, which the other Maximize card gives, is just better than haste most of the time, too, so that's what makes this worse. Like the other Maximize card, this does get better if you have instant and sorcery spell triggers. It also works well with creatures with Mentor, which will be in any red deck. But still, I think you cut it more than you play it. I'm giving it a D+. Next, we have Ordinary Goblin, which for one generic and a red is a 2-1 Goblin Warrior at common. Whenever it blocks or becomes blocked by a creature, it deals one damage to that creature. This is a nice little two-drop. It's a two-mana creature that can trade all the way up to three toughness creatures. It also effectively can't be blocked by one toughness creatures because they just die before damage. So the downside of having one toughness, the fact that it can die to X1s, is basically gone. All of that makes this creature a nice two-drop for aggressive red decks. Note, by the way, that even blocking with it can take down three toughness creatures. It's not all aggressive. It can actually block and do the one damage as well, so it's okay as a blocker too. I think it's a nice solid C. Next, we have Risk Factor, which for two generic and a red is an instant at rare. Target opponent may have Risk Factor deal four damage to them. If that player doesn't, you draw three cards, and it has Jumpstart. This is reminiscent of an old and bad cycle of cards from Judgment that all let your opponent choose between taking damage or giving you other effects. Those cards were all pretty bad. Q, by the way, someone defending book burning in the comments, as they often do. Anyway, this one is a little more interesting, and this is for two reasons. The first is the fact that it has jumpstart, so your opponent has to make the choice a second time. And yeah, they're going to take four if they can take four. The only way they won't is if it kills them. If you get to draw three off of this, you're going to win the game because your opponent is clearly at four or less, and you just drew a bunch of cards, so that's nice. The other thing that makes it a little better than that old cycle is the fact that there is a Spells Matter deck in this format, and any card with Jumpstart suddenly becomes a little more playable uh, because of that fact that there's a Spells Matter deck. Overall, I don't think it's incredible or anything, but I think really aggressive decks will have fun with this and like the damage, and is it decks will like the Jumpstart enough to make it like a solid playable most of the time? I'm going to give it a C. It's definitely a card I could see being wrong about, but if I'm wrong about it, it's going to be in the opposite way. It's not going to turn out to be better. 
Next, we have Rebel Belt Boar, which is three generic and a red for a 3-3 common boar. When it enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. So the base stats here are passable, and it has an enter the battlefield trigger that will typically make it so one of your creatures can attack that couldn't before, and that's pretty nice. Also synergizes with Mentor by making a creature who can mentor things bigger and able to mentor other things. This is another solid filler level red common and another C. Next, we have Runaway Steamkin, which for one generic and a red is a 1-1 one, one elemental at rare. Whenever you cast a red spell, if Runaway Steamkin has fewer than three plus one plus one counters on it, you put a plus one plus one counter on Runaway Steamkin. You can also remove those three counters and add three red mana to your mana pool. This is a weird one to evaluate. Obviously, a two mana 1-1 one, one is bad, but because it gets bigger, at least until it becomes a 4-4, four, four, it's probably playable. Note, it only asks that you play red spells, not instants and sorcery spells, to make it bigger. Sometimes you can get that to play a bit like Prowess if you have instant speed red spells. Worth noting that your deck needs to be pretty heavy in red for this to be worth it, since if this just sits around not getting bigger, it isn't good at all. It also has some nice upside in that once it gets to 4-4, it can go back to 1-1 and give you 3 red mana. But I think most of the time you'll get more value out of this card just as a creature that keeps getting bigger. Because of the deck building requirement it asks of you and the somewhat meager payoff it gives you, I don't think this is a great card, but I think you play it in a red deck uh, that has a lot of red spells, like 10 or more maybe, uh, and I'm going to give it a solid C. Next we have Smelt Ward Minotaur, which for two generic and a red is a 2-3 Minotaur Warrior Red Uncommon. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, target creature and opponent controls can't block this turn. I'm a pretty big fan of this card, it does well in the vanilla test, and it has a powerful ability. Imagine casting a removal spell that also makes one of their other creatures unable to block. That's not really a far-fetched situation and the kind of thing that this guy will create for you. Obviously, you need to have some instants and sorceries, but I think your average deck will have five-ish of those. And obviously, if you have this guy, you're going to be a little more interested in taking them. The other nice thing about this Minotaur is it's really good in both the red guilds in this set, Boros and Is It. And there aren't a ton of cards that can say both of those things, because those two decks are so different. The Boros deck being really aggressive and the blue-red deck really caring about spells. But this is good in both, because it's good... To make things unable to block in an aggressive deck and the is it deck will be running more cards with jumpstart and more spells in general helping make this guy unblockable and obviously the fail case you have here is a three mana two three anyway so he's pretty good on the face of it uh and he's going to be doing some crazy things from time to time as a result of all of that stuff i think it's first pickable and i'm going to give it a straight up Next, we have Street Riot. For four generic and a red, it's an uncommon enchantment, and it says as long as it's your turn, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and have trample. I like the text box in here okay, but the cost is crazy steep. I get it, the idea is to go wide and have this be lethal all of a sudden, but it's another one of those red cards that you won't really be able to cast until it's lethal, because oftentimes not advancing your board in any significant way and spending five mana doing nothing can lead to you falling way behind. I mean, I don't know why they couldn't make this so that your creature still gets plus one plus zero on your turn. Like, that wouldn't make it that much better, but it would make it enough better that I would be more interested in it. As is, uh, I think it's a D. Next, we have Sure Strike, which for one generic and a red is a common instant, and target creature gets plus three plus zero and gains first strike until the turn. We see this trick all the time, and it's always a solid one. It can make most creatures win combat for only two mana, and that's a decent investment. I think red decks, especially creature-heavy ones, want to play this in most scenarios. Tricks, of course, can typically never find themselves as with a really high score unless they do something incredible just because they are so situational. But a C for a trick is pretty good, and I think that's what Sure Strike gets. Next, we have Torch Courier, which for one red mana is a 1-1 goblin with haste, and you can sack it to give another target creature haste until end of turn. I'm never impressed by Raging Goblin, and this is obviously strictly better because it can later sack itself to give something else haste, and that's nice because this 1-1 one, one body will become irrelevant really quickly. Obviously, it is a good creature to mentor. If your deck is like heavy with two drops and three drops that have mentor, playing this might become a little more of a priority for you because it's not going to be hard for you to make it into a 2-2, two, two. but I don't think that saves this from being the kind of card you want to cut most of the time, and I'm going to give it a D+. Our last card is Wojek Bodyguard, which for two generic and a red is a 3-3 human soldier at common. It has Mentor, and it can't attack or block alone. I like this card. A 3-mana 3-3 is great on the vanilla test, and since it comes with Mentor, it's even better. Since it can mentor both 1-1s and 2-2s, even before it gets mentored at all itself. Yes, it has the downside, can't attack or block alone, and as a result, he won't be what you want in most, like, is it decks? But he's going to smash in a lot of faces in Boros decks, which will plan on trying to curve out with mentor creatures and win very quickly, and this fits perfectly into that plan. This is a nice common, I'm giving it a C+. 
And that does it for all the red cards in Guilds of Ravnica. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so others can enjoy it too. If you disagree with anything I said in this video, let me know in the comments below. And if you want to make sure you catch future content, including the continuation of my Guilds of Ravnica limited review, which continues tomorrow with green, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Thank you.